Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez Part 1 On the day they were going to kill him, Santiago Nassar got up at 5.30 in the morning to wait for the boat the bishop was coming on. He dreamed he was going through a grove of timber trees where a gentle drizzle was falling, and for an instant he was happy in his dream. But when he awoke, he felt completely spattered with bird shit. He was always dreaming about trees, Placida de Nero, his mother, told me 27 years later, recalling the details of that distressing Monday. The week before, he dreamed that he was alone in a tinfoil airplane and flying through the almond trees without bumping into anything, she said to me. She had a well-earned reputation as an accurate interpreter of other people's dreams, provided they were told her before eating, but she hadn't noticed any ominous augury in those two dreams of her son's, or in the other dreams of trees he described to her on the mornings preceding his death. Nor did Santiago Nassar recognize the omen. He had slept little and poorly without getting undressed, and he woke up with a headache and a sediment of copper stirrup on his palate, and he interpreted them as the natural havoc of the wedding revels that had gone on until after midnight. Furthermore, all the many people he ran into after leaving his house at five minutes past six, and until he was carved up like a pig an hour later, remembered him as being a little sleepy, but in a good mood. And he remarked to all of them in a casual way that it was a very beautiful day. No one was certain if he was referring to the state of the weather. Many people coincided in recalling that it was a radiant morning with a sea breeze coming in through the banana groves, as was to be expected in a fine February of that period. But most agreed that the weather was funereal, with a cloudy low sky and the thick smell of still waters, and that at the moment of the misfortune a thin drizzle was falling like the one Santiago Nassar had seen in his dream grove. I was recovering from the wedding revels in the apostolic lap, of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes, and I only awakened with the clamor of the alarm bells, thinking they had turned them loose in honor of the bishop. Santiago Nassar put on a shirt and pants of white linen, both items unstarched, just like the ones he'd put on the day before for the wedding. It was his attire for special occasions. If it hadn't been for the bishop's arrival, he would have dressed in his khaki outfit and the riding boots he wore on Mondays to go to the Divine Face, the cattle ranch he'd inherited from his father, and which he administered with very good judgment, but without much luck. In the country, he wore a three fifty seven Magnum on his belt, and its armored bullets, according to what he said, could cut a horse in two through the middle. During the partridge season, he would also carry his falconry equipment, and in the closet he kept a Mannlicher Schoenauer 306 rifle, a 300 Holland and Holland Magnum rifle, a 22 caliber Hornet with a double-powered telescopic sight, and a Winchester repeater. He always slept the way his father had slept, with the weapon hidden in the pillowcase. But before leaving the house that day, he took out the bullets and put them in the drawer of the night table. He never left it loaded, his mother told me. I knew that, and I also knew that he kept the guns in one place and hid the ammunition in another, far removed, so that nobody, not even casually, would yield to the temptation of loading them inside the house. It was a wise custom, established by his father ever since one morning when a servant girl had shaken the case to get the pillow out, and the pistol went off as it hit the floor, and the bullet wrecked the cupboard in the room, went through the living room wall, passed through the dining room of the house next door with the thunder of war, and turned a life-size saint on the main altar of the church on the opposite side of the square to plaster dust. Santiago Nassar, who was a young child at the time, never forgot the lesson of that accident. The last image his mother had of him was of his fleeting passage through the bedroom. He'd wakened her while he was feeling around, trying to find an aspirin in the bathroom medicine chest. And she turned on the light and saw him appear in the doorway with a glass of water in his hand. 
so she would remember him forever. Santiago Nassar told her then about the dream, but she didn't pay any great attention to the trees. Any dream about birds means good health, she said. She had watched him from the same hammock and in the same position in which I found her prostrated by the last lights of old age when I returned to this forgotten village, trying to put the broken mirror of memory back together from so many scattered shards. She could barely make out shapes in full light and had some medicinal leaves on her temples for the eternal headache that her son had left her the last time he went through the bedroom. She was on her side, clutching the cords at the head of the hammock as she tried to get up, and there in the half-shadows was a baptistry smell that had startled me on the morning of the crime. No sooner had I appeared on the threshold than she confused me with the memory of Santiago Nassar. There he was, she told me. He was dressed in white linen that had been washed in plain water because his skin was so delicate that it couldn't stand the noise of starch. She sat in the hammock for a long time, chewing peppercress seeds, until the illusion that her son had returned left her. And then she sighed. He was the man in my life. I saw him in her memory. He had turned twenty-one the last week in January, and he was slim and pale, and had his father's Arab eyelids and curly hair. He was the only child of a marriage of convenience, without a single moment of happiness. But he seemed happy with his father until the latter died suddenly three years before, and he continued seeing, seeming to be so with his solitary mother until the Monday of his death. From her, he had inherited a sixth sense. From his father, he learned at a very early age the manipulation of firearms, his love for horses, and the mastery of high-flying birds of prey. But from him, he also learned the good arts of valor and prudence. They spoke Arabic between themselves, but not in front of Placida Linero, so that she wouldn't feel excluded. They were never seen armed in town, and the only time they brought in their trained birds was for a demonstration of falconry at a charity bazaar. The death of his father had forced him to abandon his studies at the end of secondary school in order to take charge of the family ranch. By his nature, Santiago Nassar was merry and peaceful and open-hearted. On the day they were going to kill him, his mother thought he'd got his days mixed up when she saw him dressed in white. I reminded him that it was Monday, she told me. But he explained to her that he'd got dressed up in pontifical style in case he had a chance to kiss the bishop's ring. She showed no sign of interest. He won't even get off the boat, she told him. He'll give an obligatory blessing, as always, and go back the way he came. He hates this town. Santiago Nassar knew it was true but church pomp had an irresistible fascination for him. It's like the movies, he told me once. The only thing that interested his mother about the bishop's arrival, on the other hand, was for her son not to get soaked in the rain, since she'd heard him sneeze while he was sleeping. She advised him to take along an umbrella, but he waved goodbye and left the room. It was the last time she saw him. Victoria Guzman, the cook, was sure that it hadn't rained that day or during the whole month of February. On the contrary, she told me when I came to see her a short time before her death. The sun warms things up earlier than in August. She had been quartering three rabbits for lunch, surrounded by panting dogs, when Santiago Nassar entered the kitchen. He always got up with the face of a bad knight, Victoria Guzman recalled without affection. Davina Flor, her daughter, who was just coming into bloom, served Santiago Nassar a mug of mountain coffee with a shot of cane liquor 
as on every Monday, to help him bear the burden of the night before. The enormous kitchen with the whispers from the fire and the hens sleeping in their perches was breathing stealthily. Santiago and Nassar swallowed another aspirin and sat down to drink the mug of coffee in slow sips, thinking just as slowly, without taking his eyes off the two women who were disemboweling the rabbits on the stove. In spite of her age, Victoria Guzman was still in good shape. The girl, as yet a bit untamed, seemed overwhelmed by the drive of her glands. Santiago Nassar grabbed her by the wrist when she came to take the empty mug from him. The time has come for you to be tamed, he told her. Victoria Guzman showed him the bloody knife. Let go of her, white man, she ordered him seriously. You won't have a drink of that water as long as I'm alive. She'd been seduced by Ibrahim Nassar in the fullness of her adolescence. She'd made love to him in secret for several years in the stables of the ranch, and he brought her to a house servant when the affection was over. He brought her to be a house servant when the affection was over. Davina Flor, who was the daughter of a more recent mate, knew that she was destined for Santiago Nassar's furtive bed, and that idea brought out a premature anxiety in her. Another man like that hasn't ever been born again, she told me, fat and faded and surrounded by the children of other loves. He was just like his father, Victoria Guzman answered her, a shit. But she couldn't avoid a wave of fright, as she remembered Santiago Nassar's horror when she pulled out the insides of a rabbit by the roots and threw the steaming guts to the dogs. Don't be a savage, he told her. Make believe it was a human being. Victoria Guzman needed almost twenty years to understand that a man accustomed to killing defenseless animals could suddenly express such horror. Good heavens, she explained with surprise. All that was such a revelation. Nevertheless, she had so much repressed rage the morning of the crime that she went on feeding the dogs with the insides of the other rabbits just to embitter Santiago Nassar's breakfast. And that's what they were up to when the whole town awoke with the ear-shaking bellow of the bishop steamboat. The house was a former warehouse with two stories, walls of rough planks, and a peaked tin roof where the buzzards kept watch over the garbage on the docks. It had been built in the days when the river was so usable that many sea-going barges and even a few tall ships made their way up there through the marshes of the estuary. By the time Ibrahim Nassar arrived with the last Arabs at the end of the civil wars, sea-going ships no longer came there because of shifts in the river, and the warehouse was in disuse. Ibrahim Nassar bought it at a cheap price in order to set up an import store that he never did establish, and only when he was going to be married did he convert it into a house to live in. On the ground floor he opened up a parlor that served for everything, and in back he built a stable for four animals, the servants' quarters, and a country kitchen with windows opening onto the dock, through which the stench of the water came in at all hours. The only thing he left intact in the parlor was the spiral staircase rescued from some shipwreck. On the upper floor, where the customs offices had been before, he built two large bedrooms and five cubby holes for the many children he intended having, and he constructed a wooden balcony that overlooked the almond trees on the square where Placida Linero would sit on March afternoons to console herself for her solitude. In the front, he kept the main door and built two full-length windows with lathe-turned bars. He also kept the rear door, except a bit taller, so that a horse could enter through it, and he kept a part of the old pier in use. That was always the door most used, not because it was the natural entry to the mangers and the kitchen, but because it opened onto the street that led to the new docks without going through the square. 
The front door, except for festive occasions, remained closed and barred. Nevertheless, it was there, and not at the rear door, that the men who were going to kill him waited for Santiago Nassar. And it was through there that he went out to receive the bishop, despite the fact that he would have to walk completely around the house in order to reach the docks. No one could understand such fatal coincidences. The investigating judge who came from Riracha must have sensed them without daring to admit it, for his impulse to give them a rational explanation was obvious in his report. The door to the square was cited several times with a dime novel title, The Fatal Door. In reality, the only valid explanation seemed to be that of Placida Linero, who answered the question with her mother wisdom, My son never went out the back door when he was dressed up. It seemed to be such an easy truth that the investigator wrote it down as a marginal note, but he didn't include it in the report. Victoria Guzman, for her part, had been categorical with her answer that neither she nor her daughter knew that the men were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him. But, in the course of her year, she admitted that both knew it when he came into the kitchen to have his coffee. They had been told it by a woman who had passed by after five o'clock to beg a bit of milk, and who in addition had revealed the motives and the place where they were waiting. I didn't warn him because I thought it was drunkard's talk, she told me. Nevertheless, Davina Flor confessed to me on a later visit, after her mother had died, that the latter hadn't said anything to Santiago Nassar because in the depths of her heart she wanted them to kill him. She, on the other hand, didn't warn him because she was nothing but a frightened child at the time, incapable of a decision of her own, and she She'd been all the more frightened when he grabbed her by the wrist with a hand that felt frozen and stony, like the hand of a dead man. Santiago Nassar went through the shadowy house with long strides, pursued by roars of jubilation from the bishop's boat. Davina Flor went ahead of him to open the door, trying not to have him get ahead of her among the cages of sleeping birds in the dining room among the wicker furniture and the pots of ferns hanging down in the living room. But when she took the bar down, he couldn't avoid the butcher hawk hand again. But when she took the bar down, she couldn't avoid the butcher hawk hand again. He grabbed my whole pussy, Davina Flor told him. It was what he always did when he caught me alone in some corner of the house. But that day, I didn't feel the usual surprise, but an awful urge to cry. She drew away to let him go out, and through the half-open door she saw the almond trees on the square, snowy in the light of dawn. But she didn't have the courage to look at anything else. Then the boat stopped tooting and the cocks began to crow, she told me. It was such a great uproar that I couldn't believe there were so many roosters in town, and I thought they were coming on the bishop's boat. The only thing she could do for the man who had never been hers, was leave the door unbarred against Placid Alenero's orders so that he could get back in in case of emergency. Someone who was never identified had shoved an envelope under the door with a piece of paper warning Santiago Nassar that they were waiting for him to kill him. And in addition, the note revealed the place, the motive, and other quite precise details of the plot. The message was on the floor when Santiago Nassar left home, but he didn't see it, nor did Davina Flor or anyone else, until long after the crime had been consummated. It had struck six, and the street lights were still on. In the branches of the almond trees, and on some balconies, the colored wedding decorations were still hanging, and one might have thought they'd been, they'd just been hung in honor of the bishop. But the square, covered with paving stones up to the front steps of the church where the bandstand was, looked like a trash heap, with empty bottles and all manner of debris from the public festivities. When Santiago Nassar left his house, several people were running toward the docks, 
hastening, hastened along by the bellowing of the boat. The only place open on the square was a milk shop on one side of the church, where the two men were who were waiting for Santiago Nassar in order to kill him. Clotilde Armenta, the proprietress of the establishment, was the first to see him in the glow of dawn, and she had the impression he was dressed in aluminum. He already looked like a ghost, she told me. The men who were going to kill him had slept on the benches, clutching the knives wrapped in newspapers to their chests, and Clotilde Armenta held her breath so as not to awaken them. They were twins, Pedro and Paolo Vicario. They were 24 years old, and they looked so much alike that it was difficult to tell them apart. They were hard-looking, but of a good sort, the report said. I, who had known them since grammar school, would have written the same thing. That morning they were still wearing their dark wedding suits, too heavy and formal for the Caribbean, and they looked devastated by so many hours of bad living, but they'd done their duty and shaved. Although they hadn't stopped drinking since the eve of the wedding, they weren't drunk at the end of three days, but they looked rather like insomniac sleepwalkers. They'd fallen asleep with the first breezes of dawn, after almost three hours of waiting in Clotilde Armenta's store, and it was the first sleep they had had since Friday. They had barely awakened with the first bellow of the boat, but instinct awoke them completely when Santiago Nassar came out of his house. Then they both grabbed the rolled-up newspapers, and Pedro Vicario started to get up. For the love of God, murmured Clotilde Armenta, leave him for later, if only out of respect for his grace, the bishop. It was the breath, it was the breath of the Holy Spirit, she often repeated. Indeed, it had been a providential happening, but of momentary value only. When they heard her, the Vicario twins reflected, and the one who had stood up sat down again. Both followed Santiago Nassar with their eyes as he began to cross the square. They looked at him more with pity, Clotilde Armenta said. At that moment, the girls from the nun's school crossed the square, trotting in disorder inside their orphans' uniforms. Placida Linero was right. The bishop didn't get off his boat. There were a lot of people at the dock in addition to the authorities and the school children and everywhere one could see the crates of well-fattened roosters they were bearing as a gift for the bishop, because coxcomb soup was his favorite dish. At the pier there was so much firewood piled up that it would have taken at least two hours to load. But the boat didn't stop. It appeared at the bend in the river, snorting like a dragon, and then the band of musicians started to play the bishop's anthem and the cocks began to crow in their baskets and aroused all the other roosters in town. In those days, the legendary paddle wheelers that burned wood were on the point of disappearing, and the few that remained in service no longer had player pianos or bridal staterooms and were barely able to navigate against the current. But this one was new and it had two smokestacks instead of one, with the flag painted on them like armbands, and the wheel made of planks at the stern gave it the drive of a seagoing ship. On the upper deck, beside the captain's cabin, was the bishop in his white cassock, and with his retinue of Spaniards. It was Christmas weather, my sister Margot said. What happened, according to her, was that the boat whistle let off a shower of compressed steam as it passed by the docks, and it soaked those who were closest to the edge. It was a fleeting illusion. The bishop began to make the sign of the cross in the air opposite the crowd on the pier, and he kept on doing it mechanically afterwards, without malice or inspiration, until the boat was lost from view and all that remained was the uproar of the roosters. Santiago Nassar had reason to feel cheated. He had contributed several loads of wood to the public solicitudes of Father Carmen Amador, and in addition he himself had chosen the capons with the most appetizing combs. But it was a passing annoyance, 
My sister Margot, who was with him on the pier, found him in a good mood and with an urge to go on with the festivities in spite of the fact that the aspirants had given him no relief. He didn't seem to be chilly and was only thinking about what the wedding must have cost, she told me. Cristo Bedoya, who was, there, who was with him, revealed figures that added to his surprise. He'd been carousing with Santiago Nassar and me until a little before four. He hadn't gone to sleep at his parents, but stayed chatting at his grandparents' house. There he obtained the bunch of figures that he needed to calculate what the party had cost. He recounted that they had sacrificed forty turkeys and eleven hogs for the guests, and four calves which the bridegroom had set up to be roasted for the people on the public square. He recounted that two hundred and five cases of contraband alcohol had been consumed, and almost two thousand bottles of cane liquor, which had been distributed among the crowd. There wasn't a single person, rich or poor, who hadn't participated in some way in the wildest party the town had ever seen. Santiago Nassar was dreaming aloud. That's what my wedding's going to be like, he said. Life will be too short for people to tell about it. My sister felt the angel pass by. She thought once more about the good fortune of Flore Miguel, who had so many things in life and was going to have Santiago Nassar as well on Christmas of that year. I suddenly realized that there couldn't have been a better catch than him, she told me. Just imagine, handsome, a man of his word, and with a fortune of his own at the age of 21. She used to invite him to have breakfast at our house when there were manioc fritters, and my mother was making some that morning. Santiago Nassar accepted with enthusiasm. I'll change my clothes and catch up with you, he said, and he realized that he'd left his watch behind on the night table. What time is it? It was 6.25. Santiago Nassar took Cristo Bedoyo by the arm and led him toward the square. I'll be at your house inside of 15 minutes, he told my sister. She insisted that they go together right away because breakfast was already made. It was a strange insistence, Cristo Bedoya told me. So much so that sometimes I've thought that Margot already knew that they were going to kill him and wanted to hide him in your house. Santiago Nassar persuaded her to go on ahead while he put on his riding clothes because he had to be at the divine face early in order to geld some calves. He took leave of her with the same wave with which he'd said goodbye to his mother and went off toward the square on the arm of Cristo Bedoya. It was the last time she saw him. Many of those who were on the docks knew that they were going to kill Santiago Nassar. Don Lázaro Ponte, a colonel from the academy making use of his good retirement and town mayor for eleven years, waved to him with his fingers. I had my own very real reasons for believing he wasn't in any danger anymore, he told me. Father Carmen Amador wasn't worried either. When I saw him safe and sound, I thought it had all been a fib, he told me. No one even wondered whether Santiago Nassar had been warned because it had seemed impossible to all that he hadn't. In reality... My sister Margot was one of the few people who still didn't know that they were going to kill him. If I'd known, I would have taken him home with me even if I had to hog-tie him, she declared to the investigator. It was strange that she hadn't known, but it was even stranger that my mother didn't know either because she knew about everything before anyone else in the house, in spite of the fact that she hadn't gone out into the street in years, not even to attend Mass. I had become aware of that quality of hers ever since I began to get up early for school. I would find her the way she was in those days, pale and stealthy, sweeping the courtyard with a homemade broom in the ashen glow of dawn, and between sips of coffee she would proceed to tell me what had happened in the world while we'd been asleep. She seemed to have secret threads of communication with the other people in town, especially those her age and sometimes she would surprise us with news so ahead of its time that she could only have known it through powers of divination. 
That morning, however, she didn't feel the throb of the tragedy that had been gestating since three o'clock. She'd finished sweeping the courtyard, and when my sister Margot went out to meet the bishop, she found her grinding manioc for the fritters. Cocks could be heard, my mother is accustomed to saying, remembering that day. She never associated the distant uproar with the arrival of the bishop, however, but with the last leftovers from the wedding. Our house was a good distance from the main square, in the mango grove on the river. My sister Margot had gone to the docks by walking along the shore, and the people were too excited with the bishop's visit to worry about any other news. They'd placed the sick people in the archways to receive God's medicine, and women came running out of their yards with turkeys and suckling pigs and all manner of things to eat. And from the opposite shore came canoes bedecked with flowers. But after the bishop passed without setting foot on land, the other repressed news assumed its scandalous dimensions. Then it was that my sister Margot learned about it in a thorough and brutal way. Angela Vicario, the beautiful girl who'd gotten married the day before, had been returned to the house of her parents because her husband had discovered that she wasn't a virgin. I felt that I was the one who was going to die, my sister said. But no matter how much they tossed the story back and forth, no one could explain to me how poor Santiago Nassar ended up being involved in such a mix-up. The only thing they knew, for sure, was that Angela Vicario's brothers were waiting for him to kill him. My sister returned home, gnawing at herself inside to keep from crying. She found my mother in the dining room, wearing a Sunday dress with blue flowers that she had put on in case the bishop came by to pay us a call. And she was singing the fado about invisible love as she set the table. My sister noted that there was one more place than usual. It's for Santiago Nassar, my mother said. They told me you had invited him for breakfast. Take it away, my sister said. And then she told her. But it was as if she already knew, she said to me. It was the same as always. You begin telling her something, and before the story is half over, she already knows how it came out. That bad news represented a naughty problem for my mother. Santiago Nassar had been named for her, and she was his godmother when he was christened, but she was also a blood relative of Puro Vicario, the mother of the returned bride. Nevertheless, no sooner had she heard the news than she put on her high-heeled shoes and the church shawl she only wore for visits of condolence. My father, who had heard everything from his bed, appeared in the dining room in his pajamas and asked in alarm where she was going. To warn my friend, my dear friend, Placida, she answered. It isn't right that everyone should know that they're going to kill her son and she the only one who doesn't. But we've got the same ties to the Vicarios that we do with her, my father said. You always have to take the side of the dead, she said. My younger brothers began to come out of the other bedrooms. The smallest, touched by the breath of tragedy, began to weep. My mother paid no attention to them. For once in her life, she didn't even pay any attention to her husband. Wait a minute and I'll get dressed, he told her. She was already in the street. My brother Jaime, who wasn't more than seven at the time, was the only one who was dressed for school. You go with her, my father ordered. Jaime ran after her without knowing what was happening or where they were going and grabbed her hand. She was going along talking to herself, Jaime told me. Low lifes, she was saying under her breath. Shitty animals that can't do anything that isn't something awful. She didn't even realize that she was holding the child by the hand. They must have thought I'd gone crazy, she told me. The only thing I can remember is that in the distance you could hear the noise of a lot of people, as if the wedding party had started up again, and everybody was running toward the square.
She quickened her step with the determination she was capable of when there was life at stake, until somebody who was running in the opposite direction took pity on her madness. Don't bother yourself, Luisa Santiago, he shouted as he went by. They've already killed him. End of part one.